Hey, what's up you lot, Path here, and I wanna start by saying thank you so much for all the support that you've given me on my previous video. The third of the Maxwell's Equation series is out now. In this video, we'll be looking at a particular area of quantum mechanics, including a little bit of maths, but don't worry, as always, you don't need to know anything more than like high school level maths to understand this video. And we're going to be specifically looking at how quantum mechanics predicts the existence of two particular kinds of particles, bosons and fermions. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up button and feel free to subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So like I said, we'll be looking at bosons and fermions today. An example of a boson is of course the very famous Higgs boson and an example of a fermion is an electron. But what is it that makes these particles bosons or fermions? Well, to understand this, we're going to start by looking at some basic quantum physics. For those of you that have seen some of my other quantum physics videos, you'll recall that we use something known as a wave function, which is a description of everything we know about a particular quantum system, where of course a quantum system is of course the thing that we happen to be studying using quantum mechanics. For example, you know, a bunch of particles, that could be our system, or one particular electron moving around, that could be our system. And if we use quantum mechanics to study the behavior of the system, then it's a quantum system. And a wave function, basically, is just a mathematical function that encodes all of the information that we can know about that quantum system. In fact, a wave function is very, very closely linked to the probability distribution of our system. What does that mean? Well, let's say our system consists of a single electron that's only able to move across this single straight line. This makes it a one-dimensional system. Our particle can only move in one dimension. Well, our wave function tells us everything that we can know regarding how likely we are to find our electron at different positions along this line. But it's not actually the wave function that's directly telling us this. Specifically, it's actually the square of the wave function that's related to the probability distribution of our system. Now, the wave function of a quantum system is often labeled with the Greek letter psi. So in this case, what we're looking for is psi squared. And it's this function, like I said, that's the important one. This is the one related to the probability distribution. Specifically, this function is telling us, psi squared is telling us, that at this position here, because psi squared is large, we're more likely to find our electron. Whereas at this position here, psi squared is small, and so we're less likely to find our electron here. Now, there are more subtleties to this. There's something a little bit more intricate that I'm not gonna go into. For our purposes, all we care about is that this psi squared function is telling us the probability distribution of our electron in this case. I've talked about this in a bit more detail in other quantum physics videos that I've made, so do check them out up here if you're interested. But now, let's consider a bit more of a complicated system. Let's say instead of consisting of one electron, our system consists of two different particles. Doesn't matter what these particles are, but all that matters is that they're also restricted to just moving along this straight line. Now in quantum mechanics, it turns out that we can write a single wave function for this entire system. So we've got two particles in our system, we're calling them particle A and particle B. The wave function that we write, and subsequently psi squared, is not exactly easy to visualize or to draw physically, but rest assured it works in exactly the same way as when we had our single particle system. Earlier, we had psi squared, which was related to the probability, and this was a function of the position along our straight line. So r equals two would give us psi squared is equal to some large value, whereas r equals four would give us psi squared is equal to some small value. And in the same way for our two particle system, we've now got a dependence on the position of particle A and the position of particle B. For now, we're calling them R1 and R2 because in this particular diagram, we've got particle A at R1 and particle B at R2. And if we were to swap their positions, then we would have to find psi squared of R2, R1. Because remember, this slot is the position of particle A, and this slot is the position of particle B. Doesn't have to be R1 and R2 either. We could choose any locations along these lines. We could choose like R3 and R4, for example. This is just what I'm choosing to call it. But the point is that the wave function squared for this particular system would give us the probability of us finding these particles at the positions that we put into slot one and slot two particle A in slot one, particle B in slot two. Again, in this video, we don't actually need to look at the particular mathematical form of the wave function for the system. That's way too complicated. We don't even have enough information to find it for that matter, but we just need to know that we could find a wave function and therefore psi squared. All this will become important in a moment. And I hope what I've explained until now makes sense. If it doesn't, definitely let me know in the comments down below and I'll try and clarify. But this is where things get interesting. What we're going to do now is the following. We're going to be making a couple of assumptions and follow some basic mathematics through to see where it leads us. When we make these assumptions, we'll be able to make predictions based on the mathematics 
and we'll be able to take these predictions and test them in real life in our universe. If the predictions we make using the mathematics match what we find in experiment, match what our universe does, then it turns out that the assumptions that we made to get to those mathematical predictions are the right assumptions to make for our particular universe, at least until somebody else comes along and proves them wrong. And in many ways, this is how theoretical physics interacts with experimental physics. Sometimes experimentalists discover things and it's up to the theorists to try and explain how they happened, whereas sometimes the theorists come up with some mathematical prediction and it's up to the experimentalists to test that. I'm not saying that when bosons and fermions were discovered, this is how things happened in real life. But what I'm saying is that in this video, that's how we're going to be doing it. And all of this sounds really vague, so let's actually discuss the assumption that we're going to be making. We've got our two particle system, which consists of particles A and B. We said nothing about what kinds of particles they are, and we're still not going to say what particular kind of particle they are, except we're going to now assume that these two particles are identical to each other. Identical in every way. They have the same mass, they have the same charge, they have the same every other property that you can think of. But that's not it. We're actually going to go a little bit further. Not only are we going to assume that these two particles are identical to each other, we're going to assume that they're indistinguishable from each other. This is a very subtle point. Identical and indistinguishable don't mean the same thing. If we've got two identical particles, we know that they've got the same charge, the same mass, etc, etc, but we can still tell this is particle A and this is particle B. You can track which particle is which over time. Even if you turned away and looked away from the system and then you left it for 30 seconds, one hour, 10 minutes or whatever, you could be pretty confident that particle A is still particle A and particle B is still particle B. But our quantum system is going to be weirder than that, and we'll see why we make this assumption later on. In our quantum system, let's say we label this particle particle A and this particle particle B. We leave it for 30 seconds, five minutes, one hour, three days, however long you want, and come back to it. We are not going to be able to tell whether we still have particle A here and particle B there. We're going to make the assumption that we cannot label these particles and know which one is which. And this is what it means for these particles to be indistinguishable. Not only are they identical, but we actually can't label them and track one from the other. Like I said, this sounds really weird, but we'll see why we do that momentarily. But first, how do we encode this weird assumption mathematically? Well, one consequence of the fact that we have indistinguishable particles must be that their probability distributions are exactly the same, regardless of whether we have what we call particle A here and particle B there, or whether they're swapped around. In simple words, the system must look exactly the same regardless of whether the particles are arranged in this order or in this order. And when I say look the same, what I mean is that the probability distribution must be the same. The probability of us finding particle A here and particle B there must be exactly the same as the probability of us finding particle B here and particle A there. Because if these two probabilities weren't the same, then we'd be able to devise some sort of experiment to tell us whether we had the orientation AB or BA. So let's say we're once again dealing with positions R1 and R2, and again, we're just looking at R1 and R2 arbitrarily. We could choose any two positions, it doesn't matter. But because these particles are indistinguishable, the probability, which is psi squared, of having particle A in position R1 and B in position R2 must be equal to the probability, that's psi squared, of having particle B in position 1 and particle A in position 2. That's how we encode this mathematically. So now that we've mathematically encoded for the assumption that we're making, Let's see what happens when we follow the math through. One thing that we can do is to take the square root of both sides of our equation here. When we take the square root of both sides, what we'll actually find is psi, the wave function. What we find is psi of r1 and r2 is equal to plus or minus the psi of r2 and r1. Remember, when we take the square root of a function, we have to consider the positive and the negative root. We could put plus or minus signs on the left-hand side as well, but that'd be a bit redundant considering we've already included them on the right. So we can split this up into two separate solutions of our assumption equation. The first one being that psi of r1 r2 is equal to psi of r2 r1, which basically means that the wave function when particle a is in position 1 and particle b is in position 2 is exactly equal to the wave function when the two particles are swapped over. Whereas the other solution incorporates the negative sign, which basically means that the wave function when particle A is in position 1 and particle B is in position 2 is equal to the negative of the wave function when the particles are swapped around. What we've discovered here are two separate classes or two separate kinds of indistinguishable particles. Any particles that have wave functions that behave like this are known as bosons. And any particles that have wave functions that behave like this are called fermions. 
And as it turns out, basically the mathematical prediction that we were talking about earlier, based on our assumption, is that there are two kinds of indistinguishable particles, one which have wave functions that behave like this, and the other which have wave functions that behave like this. Because remember, aside from the fact that these particles must be indistinguishable, we didn't say anything about what the particles must be. We kept our maths very general. And as it turns out, in our universe, there are particles that behave like bosons. Higgs boson, photons, gluons, I think, as well. And there are particles that behave like fermions, electrons, quarks, etc. Two electrons, for example, are indeed indistinguishable because other predictions that, that follow from the maths that we've done have been tested, and it turns out they hold as well. But it also turns out that for a pair of electrons, when you swap their positions, the wave function does indeed become negative. And by the way, all this maths that we've done can indeed be extended to multiparticle systems. It doesn't have to be limited to two particles, and it also can be extended into three dimensions of space, but they have the same kind of behavior. A direct consequence of this maths that we've discovered, this rather simple looking maths, psi r1 r2 is equal to psi r2 r1, is that bosons can display a particular kind of behavior known as Bose-Einstein condensation. Some of you have asked me to make a video about this, and I definitely will do that in the future, because it's a really interesting topic. Whereas for fermions, it turns out that this particular equation has a direct consequence in the Pauli exclusion principle. Some of you might have heard of this principle, some of you have actually asked me to make a video about it as well, which I will do in the future, and this principle actually directly dictates how electrons can arrange themselves in atoms, thereby being pretty much responsible for all of chemistry and the universe we see around us effectively. And all of that can be predicted based on the mathematics we've discussed in this video. Hopefully you'll agree that the mathematics wasn't massively difficult, it's tricky, don't get me wrong, but it's not astronomically hard. I guess that's why I like quantum mechanics, because I'm terrible at maths. <laughs> So let's have a little recap. Two particles identical to each other in a one-dimensional system. At this point, we're not saying what kinds of particles, we're just making the assumption that they're identical and indistinguishable. If they have to be indistinguishable, then their probability distributions have to be identical to each other, regardless of which orientation we've got those two particles in. If the probability distributions have to be the same, then the wave functions, which are the square root of the probability distribution, there or thereabouts, must either be equal to each other when the particles are swapped, or be equal to the negative of each other when the particles are swapped. These are two different kinds of wave function, and we've discovered two classes of indistinguishable particle. When the wave functions are equal upon particle exchange, these particles are known as bosons. When the wave functions become negative upon particle exchange, these particles are known as fermions. Bosons and fermions display very different behaviors to each other, actually as a consequence of the wave function behaviors that they display. Bosons were named after the Indian physicist Satyendranath Bose, and fermions were named after the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. So even though at the beginning of the video we spent some time understanding that the square of the wave function can be interpreted as the probability distribution of our system, which in itself is conceptually quite tricky, why is that a thing? We'll talk about that in a different video. The maths that we did in this video, some squaring, some square rooting, actually led us to something profound. We just discovered two different kinds of particle. And yeah, like I said earlier, there are some mathematical intricacies that are left out, but we don't need to do any of that to understand the concept behind these indistinguishable particles and the fact that bosons and fermions exist from coming from some relatively simple maths. So I hope you found this video useful. If you did, then please do leave a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments down below if I've made a mistake. I'll try and correct that as quickly as possible. And if you want me to clarify anything, let me know in the comments below as well. And do tell me what other topics you'd like me to talk about in future videos. I've got a second channel now, Path to Shenanigans. I'll leave a link in the description box below if you're interested in checking out some of my music. And also follow me on Instagram at Path Vlogs if you want to see what I get up to on a more day-to-day -day basis. Having said that, I haven't posted on Instagram in probably about three weeks, so on a three-week to three-week basis. I'm going to end this video here. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye-bye-bye.